Okay, welcome to another episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. Dashi Al Miller here from Warrior Concepts. And uh, we're just going to jump right into things. So the topic for uh, today's uh, training is Kihai or Kihai, right? Uh, different pronunciation, same kanji. Sometimes there's a slightly alternate kanji, but it means the same thing. Uh, K or Ki is uh, energy, right? But it can also mean intent. It can mean mood. There's a whole bunch of things with it. Um, but what we're really looking at here is intent, right? What's your idea? What's your what's your agenda, so to speak? Okay. So this is uh, for those of you who've been following along for a while, and if not, no big deal. This is one of the eight hop bowl, right, or areas of study uh, reminders, right, that Takamas Sensei uh, passed on to Hatsumi Sensei, my teacher, uh, when he passed on, or when he was teaching him and passing on the Densho collection of techniques, and the makimono, right, the scrolls with the principles and concepts. Often I say, uh, or I've described these things uh, as uh, being in the scrolls, mm, probably not written directly, but uh, Takuma Sensei uh, wrote a whole bunch of things, right, uh, booklets and and little reminder notes and things like that that he would send with Hatsumi Sensei after he came to visit, did a weekend of training or whatever, and then he'd you know, head back home, Takuma Sensei would give him these extra things. Uh, not everything from this particular school, the Gyoko school, uh, but, you know, things on how to govern a province, how to fortify or, or create fortifications and things like that. Things that, you know, if we're only looking at the Densho, we're only looking at the, at the Makimono, and we're not looking at the greater body of knowledge that was passed on, we're going to miss these things. And here's something else to consider. Not everything was written down, okay? Uh, depending on the people and how and what kind of person they were when they were when they were moving along right uh there was way more stuff written down during the Edo period than there was during the Jigo, uh, uh sengaku G, uh, jidai warring states period right sengoku jidai warring states period because you know if there's war and, there, and there's battles and conflict all the time you know time to sit down and freaking write out dissertations and shit like that right during relative eras of peace well now you got something different going on okay so uh, also we have to consider that a lot of these people, while they were educated in the uh, in the Heihou or military arts, they were warriors, right? They were very very good with certain things. They had a lot of understanding. They could they could communicate it from teacher to student, that kind of thing. Uh, they couldn't read or write, okay? So, right? There's a lot of things that's there. There's another consideration that I don't think a lot of people think about. Uh, and that is that a lot of things were common sense to warriors just across the board, right? So why the hell would you write something down that everybody understood, okay? It's kind of like uh, in our Mikyo, right, in our uh, esoteric uh, mind science stuff, uh, there's teachings on karma and stuff like that, but or ways of looking at, at, under, at understanding how it works. But there was no clearly defined or de definition or very few uh, definitions early on about what karma was itself, right? The Buddha himself certainly didn't teach very much about karma, which is why when you read the Four Noble Truths, you hit truth number three, which is the liberation or freedom from suffering and all that, which is understanding cause and effect. There's not as much there as there is in the other areas, right? All the things that people tend to see that the, there are these long dissertations came long after him. Well, why didn't he teach on it? Because everybody knew it, right? Everybody knew what it was, right? It's kind of like gravity, okay? Unless you're studying it and you're going to use it because you're launching spaceships into, into orbit or whatever, and you got to fight against it or whatever, right? So uh, those folks, those of us who have been in actual combat, whether it's through law enforcement, military, whatever, um, there are certain things that you just understand. And... If I have students that haven't been in those scenarios, I have to explain it, right? And it takes a lot of class time. It takes a lot of training time before we can even get to fixing things, right? Or I have to explain these things when they ask, well, why? Why are we doing it this way? Can't I do it like this over here? Well, you're a grown up. You can do whatever you want. However, here's the reality of warfare. Here's the reality when weapons are involved, when this particular type of weapons involved in this particular type of environment. See, I don't have to explain any of that stuff when I'm dealing with somebody who's been there. I can just say, 
you've been there, you know what I'm talking about, you know, we need to, we need to consider these things. Okay. So anyway, all right. Um, so let me just jump into my notes here. Okay. Uh, again, we'll start off with a, with a problem, but again, we're, we're taking a look at strategic use and hiding of intention during the session. Okay. So uh, a big problem is that when we think about fighting and martial arts and things like that, right, we can often think in terms of a contest. We may not use the word, right? Uh, but what we're really thinking about is one winning, one losing. But are we thinking about killing the other person or being killed? I was in high school fights. They weren't the same as some of the little, we'll call them altercations, that I was in with trained killers when I was doing uh, terrorist, counterterrorism operations and things like that, right? Uh, my, my joke with a lot of folks, uh, having been a military cop, is that 80% of the people that I arrested uh, were trained killers, okay? So those fights didn't go the same way, right? Th those apprehensions and whatnot didn't go the same way that a lot of things happen, okay? And when we talk about intention, one of the things we have to talk about is what's your end game, right? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But the, the, the idea of one winning, one losing, right? That's not the problem because that's, that's the nature of warfare. That's the nature of conflict, right? Both people are fighting for the same prize. One's trying, both are trying to win, right? The problem is when we think about getting to the ending, using the same strategy and tactics and often the same techniques that our opponent's using. Okay. We're doing the slug fest, right? Or we're doing kickboxing or whatever we're doing, right? And he's seen it all before, right? That's what every that's what everybody does, right? And then we have end up with a problem. Okay. So the focus in this kind of realm with this kind of thinking is on throwing more and taking more than the other guy, right? And we're hoping that we can do more and shut him down before he does the same thing to me. Okay. Um the problem is that most tend to think from the perspective of technique, right? So, but the warrior uses everything at his or her uh, disposal to win, right? And the idea is to win as quickly, as easily, and with the least amount of wear and tear on yourself as possible, right? So see, intention, right? What's the goal, right? If the goal is just to win the fight or the goal is just to give it your best shot, right? I've had students that have come in who had lots of <laughs> lots of fights under their belt, so to speak, before they came in. And, you know, some are still here. Some have gone on in the world. But usually somewhere in the, in the process, there's a trans transformation, right? Uh, and the transformation is one where they came in having a fight mentality that's like, I'm going to step up and, well, we'll see what happens, okay? And then leaving thinking, you know, I've gotten into fights with people, never considering that this person might be trying to kill me or might pull a weapon out in the middle of this fist fight or whatever, right? And so one, I need to gauge what I'm willing to get involved in. And two, I need to learn to fight or learn to handle things in a way like a warrior where I, I, my intention is to handle the worst possible scenarios, which is why our stuff is based on dealing with somebody with a sword or spear, right? Your body's profiled, all those kind of things, right? So luckily in the 21st century, not many people fight this way, which gives us a huge advantage because he's never seen it before. But it looks odd to most people because nobody does it that way, right? Why does nobody do it that way? Because people are basing it on one thing without ever considering that they might have to avoid an incoming stab or whatever. And I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to learn a whole bunch of techniques and tactics ag against different scenarios and then have to intellectually sort that out when it's coming at me. That's what I want him to do. He has to figure the thing out on the fly because he's never been there before. Right. But if we handle, if we, we come at it from the perspective of, of, you know, it's a sword or a spear or something really worse coming down that center line, then in all honesty, everything gets easier by comparison. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that life and death is easy and all that, but a warrior gives themselves the greatest advantage. 
Okay. And I'm going to mention this again as we go on, but every warrior that we read about, Musashi, all these guys, right, were products of their time. And I'm going to talk about what that meant here shortly, but uh, people tend to fall into what's going on. And, you know, we're social creatures, so we tend to get socially influenced. Anyway, all right, let's just keep, keep going. All right. So um, this idea of, this this slugfest kind of thing right so this is where contest based fighting and hey ho hey ho that's not like hey ho that not that okay so <laughs> hey ho uh military arts martial arts right most people they equate martial with fighting but the word martial implies warfare right Impl implies life or death conquer or be conquered kind of things right this is not and again things change with time i get it but so does mentality. Mentality changes intention. I think I, how about if I spell that correctly? Just caught that myself. Right. Almost gave away something that's going to move in that direction. All right. So anyway, I could have just blew that off and I didn't. Anyway, so um, it's, it's where they tend to be different, right? So military or martial arts take many things into consideration to help with winning, right? So what are some of these things, right? Uh, let's use this color, right? So some considerations under hey-ho, right? Uh, one is technology. Okay, technology. What the hell does that mean? Well, uh, it could be armor. It could be weaponry, right? It could even be the clothing that we're wearing, right? We don't walk around in hakama, dogi, or kimono, we don't walk on uh, wooden gate the uh, sandals. Most of us don't walk around on bare feet on dirt roads because nothing is paved. Right? We have cars. They at best had horses and maybe wagons, right? So technology of the day, right? Um, hey ho takes into consider in consideration tactical maneuvering. And when I when I talk about this. Yes, there's a microcosm where we're kind of moving around and pacing each other, right? Um, but there's a big picture to it, right? Uh, in, in the scrolls of the Koto school, it's called Kudaidori, right? So it's this idea of, of space and, and distance between varying targets and the environment and the surface you're on and all kinds of things, right? So how do we best maneuver with these kind of conditions going on, okay? So uh another one is in maintaining lines and i don't mean like lines like maintaining lines lines of what right lines of communication uh supply lines okay so hey ho considerations are how do i keep mine open and how do i disrupt his Okay. How do I, uh, as a matter of fact, there was just a, a this is going to be time dating things, right? So if you're watching this five, 10 years from now and the Russian Ukrainian war is over, then this will be a neat history lesson, I guess, right? Uh, there was just a missile strike the other day or yesterday um, in, uh, in the a port city of Odessa, right? Uh, the president of Ukraine was meeting with the president or the prime minister of uh, Greece, I think, right? And they had just finished a meeting and were getting into their respective cars and a missile struck 500 meters from where they were, right? Ground shot, the whole deal, right? So, but the military target, it was a military target on the dock. It was a warehouse where they had these basically drone ships or boats that were going to be unmanned to go and do things and whatnot. So luckily only five people died. I don't know how many were injured at this point, but anyway, so the, it's not just supply uh you know beans and bullets and stuff like that but you know we might be trying to screw up their technology their gear whatever right shoot out a satellite dish whatever okay so here's the thing right i need to know mine but if i'm going to and here's one of those common sense things right this stuff's not written in the scrolls there's nothing in the scrolls about knowing his weapon but that was just a common sense thing if I'm going to defend against something like a sword, like a gun, like a whatever, 
I need to understand the nature of that weapon. My teacher has me since say taught on this stuff for, for a long, long time, right? You need to understand the nature of the weapon, not just yours, but his. Okay. Uh, I need to, so I need to be able to understand his so I can beat it, right? Uh, or take advantage of its weaknesses. I need to understand not just tactical maneuvering for me, but how to disrupt his ability to move tactically and freely and well, right? Maintaining supply lines, communication. Well, we're not on a battlefield per se, right? We're not a big army, but lines of communication, I need to keep the brain bucket from getting nailed too hard because the more the brain gets banged around, the more screwed up the communication or the lack of communication that goes to the muscles, things get slow, things don't work right, things get disabled, whatever, right? So, but I need to maintain mine while disrupting his, okay? And there's lots more ways to do it than just hitting somebody in the head, okay? Uh, same thing with supply lines. Yeah, we're not on a battlefield, so we're not talking about getting food in and all that kind of stuff, but how are you breathing, right? Another one of the, the hot bowl in uh, this list from the Gyoko school is uh, kokyuho, right? Proper breathing, right? Are you inhaling when you're supposed to be inhaling? Are you exhaling when you're supposed to be exhaling? Those kind of things. Are you not holding your breath? Uh, whatever, right? Um, and, and muscle tension right? That will constrict the, the blood vessels that are carrying the oxygen to the cells, to the muscles, to the nerve and, and, and uh, uh, nodes, right? The, the lymph, uh, the, just the lymph nodes, but the, the nodes in the, in the nervous system, right? All that kind of stuff, right? So everything that's in a macrocosm, think battlefield, right? Now, what does that look like uh, in a microcosm, okay? Uh, a bunch of years ago, I did a commentary on Sun Tzu's Art of War, I think it was a 13 or 15 part kind of thing. And maybe I need to dig this thing out at some point. I think I mentioned that before. Still haven't done it, but um, I don't know how many people would be interested in this high level training instead of, you know, since they just show me how to do Koku one more time because the 500,000 people that are showing Koku online the same way, that that's not doing it for me, right? I don't know. But my my commentary... Uh, was a reprint of one of the translations that I have of each chapter, but then the commentary was translating it from Battlefield, where there is a general overseeing an army to a general overseeing an army and translating those principles from macrocosm to microcosm. Again, it serves some of my students well, whatever. If, you, if you're interested in something like that and you think it might serve you, post in the comments of whatever platform you're on and let me know. And if there's enough, then maybe we'll take a look at it or maybe I'll just do it as an ongoing series or something like that or a, or a closed door uh, program. Depends on who and, and how and what. Okay. So anyway, there are these different considerations, right? Um, Hayhole also in, includes uh, or involves strategy, which in and of itself is intention right? Your, your end game. What are you trying to do? Okay. So we'll talk about that in a minute, right? Um, again, take a quick pause out here really, really quickly, just to ask you for a favor, uh, like, and share this stuff so that you tell the algorithms, whatever platform you're on, that this stuff is, uh, liked by people and whatnot. That way they share it to other people who can use it. Um, and if you want more and you want to be notified and stuff, uh, make sure you click the subscribe button or th there might be a link someplace where you can jump over and get on our email list. That way you start knowing about these things or get reminders a day or two ahead. That way you can put it right on your schedule. Okay. Anyway. All right. So, um, so again, Hey Ho in, in, involves this idea of intention. Okay. So what's important to understand is that this is going to be different. Well, actually, before we even go into intention, right? Before intention, th these these considerations, okay? These things here, right, are going to be different in every era, okay? Um, Sengoku Jedi Warring States period, Meiji era, Edo, whatever, right? You can look up all these things, okay? Doesn't matter. The armor, the weapons, all these things. They're, they're different, right? And as soon as one thing changes, okay, uh, you know, the, the, the grass and woven type armor that was worn 
uh, way back when the dachi, this big thing, everybody confuses it with an oversized katana, except it predates the katana, and it wasn't as sharp, right? So this grass armor with maybe some wooden planks, uh, you know, tied into it and stuff like that, worked perfectly fine, okay? But then along comes the katana, cuts right through this shit, right? Right into the body, whatever. What happens? Armor changes, okay? Armor changes, battlefield tactics change, posturing changes, all kinds of things because you need to maximize use of the armor. And so you have to be more precise in the way you do things. Warriors study these things, okay? Because they're important, because we're talking about life and death, not scoring points or having bragging rights because you beat somebody's ass yesterday, okay? In the realm of a warrior, beat somebody's ass yesterday, you better be looking over your shoulder all the time because they or their friends and multiple of them can be coming back because there's this thing called vendetta and revenge. You don't have that in the sport arena, right? You got a lot of smack talking, but then every once in a while somebody does something bullshit like, but it's it's all, you know, it's all fun and games till somebody loses an eye, right? And then it's just fun. Anyway, so, uh, so let me get back to my notes here, right? So again, everything, this changes, right? So this is why I have a problem with people who use words like historical or classical or traditional, right? Because I want to know what part of history you're talking about. I want to talk about, I want to know what era you're talking about when you say traditional, right? I want to know which part of classical are we talking about, okay? Because every era, Edo, uh, single Jedi, whatever, right? Every era had several periods. Typically, there were three periods, okay, within them, right? Just borrow Edo for a, for, for a second here, right? In the Edo period, right? There was an early Edo period, there was a middle Edo period, and there was a late Edo period, okay? And things were different within each of those eras because each of those eras got farther and farther away from Sengoku Jidai, which is where our stuff comes from, right? The Warring States period, okay? Where there was this all-out vying for control of Japan. So there was shit, there were, there were skirmishes and, and battles all the time, right? People were either defending their territory or they were trying to gain territory, right? So it was fighting all the time, right? And I, I, I saw this in the military. The farther away you get from the people that actually had to do the life and death stuff, the more the ideas change toward making it easier for more people to do it. Easier, less considerations or whatever, because the people that are now teaching, they heard it, but like not my grandfather used to do it like that, right? My grandfather used to use this really, really low posture, that kind of thing. But we don't do that anymore. We're up here because we want to be lighter, we want to be faster, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you're also not wearing the armor Grandpa was wearing. You're also not on a slippery, muddy, bloody battlefield like Grandpa was. You're on tatami. You're in tabi. You're right. So again, ideas change because people weren't there. Okay, and that's why after in the military, after every major battle, after every major war, right? Field manuals and training manuals are rewritten by people who survived that, right? They're not just rewritten and put in place. They're rewritten by people who were there, okay? Because the tactics have changed. Desert warfare is not the same as woodland warfare, right? I was a Cold War soldier, so I was trained in urban warfare and woodland, forest, mountain, that kind of stuff, right? Guys behind me, right? I don't mean behind me like World War II. I mean like behind me in age, okay? Uh, Afghanistan, Middle East, that kind of stuff, right? They're doing desert warfare. Uniforms look different, clothing, the boots, everything, right? It's it's all different, right? So, um, like, I respect it and I acknowledge it, but a lot of it I have a hard time relating to. Sometimes there's a glitch in my system because my training and experience runs into the modernization of things. I'll give you an example. In my day, we were using post-World War II, Vietnam era, and Korean War era equipment, okay? So we had deuce and a half uh, trucks, we had the old uh, M151 Jeeps, uh, those kind of things, right? So 
uh, that was that predated the Hummer, that predated a whole bunch of things, right? And so, and then we were also trained to identify enemy equipment, their vehicles, their planes, those kind of things. We were tested on these things, okay? Well, one day, just it's a summer day, nice and shiny. My wife and I are on some little trip, some little vacation, and I see these tan vehicles coming in my direction that my brain identifies as Eastern Bloc, Russian, or Soviet-ish trucks, vehicles. And I start thinking Red Dawn. Like very, very quickly, I start looking for uh, uh, insignia, identification, those kind of things. And I realize, holy shit. And then I do a quick search and whatnot and realize that all of our equipment has changed and our equipment today looks like the shit that I used to send or be trained to shoot rockets at way back in the day. Okay. So we have to be careful because if we're just thinking generally, better hope that he's thinking generally as well. Okay. Anyway. All right. So let's keep on going. Okay. Um, so again, warriors, uh, that we think of were products of the respective era and periods, right? Okay, so the way they fought, the way they did things was based on the armor, the technology, all these things, okay? But while this list tends to not change, but I'm sorry, this, this list changes, okay? Because the technology is going to change, which means tactical maneuvering, the in, in battlefield environment, if I'm in a back alley, uh, if I'm in a home, you know, when I was a cop, I could be in a whole bunch of different environments and I've got to, you know, I got to be able to maneuver. But ultimately, they were all urban kind of things, right? But as a soldier, mountain, woods, those kind of things, right? How you're maneuvering and how you do things takes in, into account uh, elevation, all kinds of stuff, right? So supply, like these things tend to not change, or to, tend to change what they look like and all that, right? But there's a bunch of things that don't change, and I'm not going into a long list, just know that things like uh, posture and, and things like that, um, they don't change. Intention doesn't change, okay? As long as we're thinking beyond, I just need to win this fight, okay? But, right, I've talked about this in the past. You can win a fight or a self-defense situation and ultimately lose everything that you own because there's multiple battles, in every situation, there are multiple battles to be fought and won. And the more I can think strategically and the more my intention matches this and takes more of these things into account, the more control I ultimately have. Okay, So I may have to deal with this guy in the moment, but afterwards I may have to deal with trauma. My own or family members who saw it or now heard that I just damaged another human being and they never thought I was that way and now I'm losing family members or there's arguments to, to be handled or whatever because, you know, you could should have just shot him in the leg, right? Uh, and then ultimately there could be a legal battle, right? There could be vendetta revenge things coming at it. So warriors think about these things, okay? Martial artists and fighters that are just scoring points and getting bragging rights, tend to not. And I'm not knocking those people. They, again, they're products of their, not, not era, they're products of their intention, their paradigm, the, the realm in which they are a fighter. Okay. So it's, it's not the same. Okay. Anyway. Um, so anyway, this, one of these things that, that don't, that doesn't change is this KI or KIHI, right? So again, Takuma Sensei transmitted to Hatsumi Sensei this stuff along with the Densho, the Makimono, the Gyoko Ryu. But Kehai, Kihai, this is not a Gyoko Ryu thing. I mean, it's in Gyoko Ryu, but it's not just a Gyoko Ryu thing. Okay. It's in every school of warriorship, right? This, there's this recurring theme, right? This is in Koto Ryu, it's in Shinden Furu Ryu, it's in lineages outside of our purview. Okay. Um, it's how we're going about doing things right so uh but anyway there, there, we, we can go into it a lot more deeply and i've been covering it i did i talked about this during this week's kuden podcast so if you missed that uh if you're on youtube it's under the live tab it's past monday 
uh, we talk about uh, luck, right? Uh, it's let's see, I just did it for this Tuesday, no, not Tuesday's class, this Friday class, this Friday virtual training. We'll be doing it anyway. All right, so what I'll be looking at today are two sides to this, okay? Two sides to intention, okay? Um, in a in a inner circle class I just did with students last night, right? Uh, we looked at both of these sides and then we ultimately brought them back together again because uh, this stuff is is like um, it's like a, a mountain, right? There's many different ways to get to the top of the mountain. It's like there's these we can see these this hop bowl, these eight areas, right? As eight different paths, right? But ultimately, they're only covering one particular point. But the closer you get to converging at the summit, at the top of the mountain, the more they come together and interact and, and make each other stronger and, and affect the others and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So anyway, look, we're going to look at two. We're going to keep it fairly, fairly um, uh, high perspective, okay? So the first type of intention is overt, right? Just over right it's obvious okay now ultimately we want to do the second type which is hidden we want to hide our intention but here's the thing just like with not knowing his weapon but somehow figuring that we're going to be able to defend against it but we don't understand the nature of it how it works how he maneuvers it that kind of stuff right it's really difficult to hide intention when you don't know how you produce it okay so overt intention tends to be um, what we're talking about here is projecting intent, okay? This tends to be, uh, at least in the way I teach my students, this is the early part of training, right? Um, where we are, we're communicating to this guy that, look, you may win, but I'm not going easily, okay? And here's what you have to deal with, okay? So a couple of ways that we show intention uh, through the training, right? is one is come i right so the come i take up right when i'm looking at him that kind of thing right there's a lot of these things right so this way i'm looking at him uh so i'm just going to put facial here but this is like facial micro expressions um or uh exp I'll just put expressions here that way somebody doesn't get all piggish on me anyway so come i facial expressions uh, uh verbiage right verbal Okay, what I'm saying, those kind of things. Okay, um, and uh, my my movement, okay? my movement, right? Between my posturing and my movement, that's more like martial style, right? So anybody knows how to read that, okay, can tell what I'm what I'm up to and all that. This stuff here tends to to make it uh, less physical, more. Uh, more heart, right? But together, what we're looking at here is is projecting with body, mind, spirit, right? That attitude, that kind of stuff, right? So this is where, right? The the feelings within the come I, right? If you touch me, I will kill you, right? I don't want to fight, but if you come in here, I got something waiting for you, right? Uh, whatever you throw, right? Ready for it? Let's go, okay? That kind of thing. That all, all these come I have these things, but there's two sides to training. Right, because there's also ways to hide it. So when I tell my students, and I just shared this with a bunch of students last night, last night, say Wednesday, Wednesday. So last night, right? Um, in the beginning, we teach come I, but come I give a lot away because it shows where you're open, it shows where you're closed, all those kind of things, right? But a student has to go through this to learn proper structure. So when they move from Shizen, when they move from this natural or kind of this this kind of offending thing that's not showing a lot. When they go to it, their angle's right, their distance is right, the structure is right, the posture is strong, right? Um, but again, here it gives it away. Facial micro expressions, right? It's kind of like wearing your emotions on your sleeve, okay? I'm letting this guy know, I'm pissed off, okay? Or I'm smiling, right? Please, please come in here, right? Uh, I might even say that. Right, <laughs> dude, it's been a day. So by all means, let's do this. Okay, uh, whatever. Okay, the way I move. Okay, 
my the, the the movement of my my system right if i type on dough i'm going to be a little bit i'm going to be up with the balls of my feet my legs are going to be prepping to kick body's going to be held a certain way boxers differently there's that roundedness to the shoulders the hands are in there for cover the lead toes turned in that knee and hip assembly are positioned a certain way that's different from a tie boxer you get the idea right so um but with this hidden this is concealing intention okay um and again this is later training and there's a saying right there's a saying uh, i can't remember which scrolls it comes off of but um i didn't feel your presence i didn't feel your intention right in english we often have a saying where we say i never saw that coming right or i would never have expected that from him or oh boy you caught me off guard on that one right okay but if we if we know what people look like when they're being sneaky and all that kind of stuff then you go ah see i know what you're up to i don't know what you're up to but i know you're up to something so how about if you just back off okay so we know when we do these things okay um we'll be looking at this hidden side that that's going to be the focus for this friday virtual training that we're doing uh two days from now if you're within this week okay uh if not you'll have to hope i put it out in the wild somewhere anyway um but the idea with this, uh, well, before we, before we look at the hidden side of things, uh, uh, we need to understand it, right? Just like with the technology, just like with weapons, right? Before we can hide things, we need to understand how to project it. But we'll talk about this, this toward the end. Both of these are necessary because we don't know who we're going to have to deal with, okay? And this might be exactly the thing that we need. Right. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right. Same thing. These, these are these once we understand it strategically and once we understand what the intention is and how that matches the unique situation that we're in, then we can choose overt or hidden. And even if we're doing overt, it might be hidden. Like I, like I covered with my my uh, students last night. Ultimately, we can be doing things where there's something going on where, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a minute, right? Uh, there's a part of our art where it looks like, but it is, okay? All right, so anyway, um, so blah, 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 blah. lost myself in my notes here, uh, need to understand it. Okay, so this is early Kamai training, right? Understanding how to project intent, getting, I should be able with, with a beginning to intermediate student, especially intermediate students uh, heading to towards showdown and stuff like that. When they're taking up a Kamai, I should be able to feel their intent from across the room because they're not doing Kamai. It's not a stance. They have become the Kamai. They've become Ichimonji. They've become Doko, right? They're, they are that intent. They are that feeling, right? They're projecting that. Right? Otherwise, it's just just a physical stance. Okay, and it, if it were a physical stance, we would call it a dachi. It's not a dachi; it's a kamai. Right? Anyway, um, so we need to understand that with this projection of intent, with this, the word in Japanese is iki, right? Which is mental intention. Okay, to think about fighting, to think about attacking is attacking, right? Which is something that's necessary. Uh, when we're approaching the fifth on test, okay? People call it the blade avoidance test. No, okay? we're picking up on saki, right? This kanji for ki, okay? Intent, intention, uh, idea, agenda, that kind of thing, right? Saki, right? It's often translated very nicely. It's the force of the killer. What the hell is the force of the killer, right? Saki is murderous intent. It's not the intent to bunk you on the head. Right? To authentically do the fifth on test, the Saki test, your teacher needs to try to split you in half, which is why we use a damn Shinai and not a Boken or an Aito. Okay? It's murderous intent. But you don't have to do it really, really fast. Right? We have drills that we do where we have a partner that's that's standing in Shizen, but they're facing away from their attacker, their, their partner. And that partner just has a training knife. Could be rubber, could be plastic, could be wooden, whatever. Real safe, nice, rounded, blunt end. Can't hurt you. I mean, I could. It'd be 
rammed it into you, but he's not going to penetrate you or anything like that. But they're going to start farther away and they're going to move in and they get close enough, even slowly. They're going through the motions and it's just a game of tag. So physically, well, what the hell does that have to do with murderous intent? Nothing. Okay. It's an action to help this guy with the knife run visualization and intention in his head, visually seeing this knife plunge into this body, blood gush from the wound, right? This partner go down, this murderous rage that they're running through, even the, because as they run this through their head, and this icky is present, the muscle tension will be there, right? The palms will start to sweat. This is what we're helping our partner who's standing in Shizen to pick up on. And the drill is safe, right? As soon as they pick up on it, they just do this. And if they're right, their partner will tap them and they'll change roles or they'll find another partner or whatever, right? Okay. If they're not right, if the partner hasn't even started yet, they're still standing back here and this guy's up here going, okay? He's in the process of learning something really important. The difference between picking up on Saki authentically and mental projections known as paranoia. He needs to understand the difference between those two feelings. Okay? This is a huge process, right? It's an important process, okay? If it's done correctly. Can people pass the test by luck? Sure. Yeah, we have the saying, cold, right? Cold, lucky, okay? Still got his fifth done. He avoided the incoming weapon. But all these videos are online. You can go look at old Taikai videos and things like that, right? Um, Hatsumi Sensei has always made the point, and he did during my test, that 10th Dons or 15th Dons or whoever's judging the test should be able to tell when somebody stands up and walks up to sit for the test whether or not they can pass the test. That's how much you can read somebody. That's Seishin, that's Gan Ho, that's these other Hapo coming together, right? This understanding, right? And so um, you know, see these people pass a test and Hatsumi Sensei, um, you know, uh, they pass and he'll, he'll have to look because he was fully engaged in eyes closed <clears throat> trying to hit this person, right? And then he'll open his eyes and look at the people that were judging and they'll go, yes, or oh, okay, okay. Um, but there were times when he's just like done something and somebody moved and his expression is one of surprise like oh oh okay okay congratulations right because he knows the difference between luck and you actually moving away from murder's intent so anyway all right so this icky intention and so while we're on this, right, this is a big part of the physical training, but it's really hard for stu for beginner students to get their head wrapped around it. They want to, and they understand the words that are coming out of our mouths, the teacher's mouths. I was this way too, right? But when we say relax, when we say, you know, do these things, right? But there's only so much relaxation going on. It's actually a balance between relaxation and tension, those kind of things, right? What people tend to not understand is that it all starts internally, okay? So here's a little formula for you. Intention naturally creates tension, mental, physical, and emotional. Tension produces stiffness. Short circuiting things, right? That kind of thing. And this produces lag time, slow movement, right? It all starts here, okay? If I have a single-minded intention and I get derailed, but I have to win a certain way or I have to use my style or whatever, right? Just had somebody the other night doing a test and the, the goal was their partner's gonna throw two punches. So, okay, the gosh, okay, the gosh. And then this is an opportunistic drill. So after that second, okay, the gosh, whatever's in front of them, they're supposed to tag unless there's nothing, in which case they back away, right? 
So this problem had a, this person had a problem because they go one, two, immediately they would identify something and start to move forward and then see something else and then uh, start to go for that and their whole body would lock up because under that tension, it was a test night. So under that tension, the brain was getting stuck between options and then they couldn't decide. Okay. So anyway, all right. So this use of intention serves two purposes, right? So we're going to, we're going to look at purposes here, right? Two purposes, this type of intention, overt intention. Are there more than two purposes? Yeah, probably right. For the purposes of this, my intention for this class, right? Two purposes we want to take a look at. Okay. When we're using overt projection of intention. Okay. One is dissuasion. I want to dissuade a weak or weaker hearted um, opponent. See, now this goes to Gan Ho, Seixin, those kind of things, where I need to be able to read this person and know whether their heart's really in it. Are they interested in mixing it up with me or are they dead ass committed to beating, breaking, or killing me? Okay. So this is not for the second guy, right? So. This guy wants bragging rights, probably doesn't want to be crippled. Probably doesn't want a trip to the ER. Okay. So we carded, and I can tell that by using Metzke, right? And paying attention to his eyes. All the schools have this. They have a type of Metzke, right? Watch those eyes, because if I break his spirit before, before he attacks, 70% of the fight is mine. Okay. Which is also something you need to guard against. Okay. But I want to dissuade a weaker hearted person, okay? weaker hearted uh, potential combatant. Okay? Um, it's kind of like when, when groupthink comes in and there's a couple of guys that want to jump you. Okay? Identify the guy who's in charge and a guy identify his wingman or wingmen. Okay? Uh, there's a really good scene in the movie Jack Reacher. Parking lot scene, five guys, whatever. Because you whoop the ass of the first one and you put a whooping on the first or second one after him and the last one or two or three or whatever, right? They, they're just happy to be a part of the freaking group. They're going to cut and run. And if they don't, the spirit's broken because they just watched what you did. So when you put an ass whooping on the first one or three or whatever, it needs to be an ass whooping. Right? Not like these fights where you're just knocking the guy around, then you turn your attention to this guy. Meanwhile, he's getting up. No, no, no. They need to watch you shatter a wrist, whatever, okay? And have that look in your eyes like, this is the nicest fucking thing you're going to feel all day, okay? Because everything you do to the people before them affects their spirit and resolve. If you don't understand that, if you think you're going to be doing a the, the, the Chuck Norris fight in a movie where you're fighting 10 guys and they're all nice enough to come in one or two at a time, no, 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 okay? We are, we are communicating with everyone who's not punching right now. Just like you communicate with witnesses, you communicate with video cameras. And when you communicate with them, you're communicating to a jury trial or a DA or the police who are going to be translating your, your statement. Not the same, right? Anyway, dissuasion. And I already mentioned this, right? We're going to break the spirit. Right. Typically of an equally engaged opponent. OK, so somebody equal to me. Right. I want to break his spirit weaker. I want to dissuade them. Right. This is not your day, dude. And I'm not your target. OK, this guy I need to break his spirit. OK, that changes everything down the line. Right. OK, so the hiding aspect is important because if he doesn't know what we're doing, he has a harder time stopping us. Okay. Usually what he's stuck with is having to respond to things as they can, as they come, if he can. Okay. So this is strategy, right? Um, don't let the attacker ever know what you're up to. Okay. And that's, this is needed to, okay. In needed to, nothing is ever what it looks like, which is why I smile when people go, I don't need to take a program. I don't need to join a school. I just need YouTube videos. How are they translating the videos based on what they already understand that they're going to translate it based on what they think they see. 
So anyway, um, so here's the thing, right? Well, I'm going to talk about a couple of these things that come from the lineages, but the whole premise behind these is he knows that you're there, but he can't sense your intention, right? He doesn't know what you're going to do. So he has to go, he's, he's limited with only what he sees. Okay. I, I cut off the, the lines of communication, right? Another way to say this is I'm not going to be a spy for his army. That's what happens when you have a tell, you use the same fight style, you fight like everybody else, whatever. He doesn't have to collect very much fucking information. He doesn't have to guess. You're just doing it. Right? Not you, because you guys are all enlightened. Okay? But anyway, in our art, across our schools, this shows up in several ways. Okay? So a few of them, again, just going to do a few of them. Right? So one, uh, we have this concept, I just call it receiving hands. Okay? It's, a, it's a type of uke nagash right? Uh, receiving hands. So uh, I'm sure you've seen these things. Uh, grab comes in, it could grab your sleeve, it could grab mune, it could grab your, your lapel kind of thing right here. And your hand kind of drifts up, right? Right around the forearm elbow kind of thing. Um, in Gyoko school, there's that one. Uh, Gyoko also uses some koto things because they're kind of complementary systems. But the Gyoko to you, the hand will come up here and the thumb will be between the flats of his fingers, knuckles kind of thing, and your chest. Right? So it creates a barrier. So he can't just like grab, try to punch into that phrenic nerve or that vagus nerve, right? To disrupt your heart rate and your breathing and shit like that. Right. So it comes in here, but the fingers just drape. They're very soft and very relaxed. Okay. Uh to you, it's in here more like a push-up position. Uh Tagagi Ocean, it's this way. Shinden Fudo to you, it's almost the same, but this index finger kind of gets caught in here, kind of thing. Right. This there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but the trick is to put your hand in that position but he doesn't feel threatened, right? When he grabs or whatever, just to him, and if you match it with like body language and facial micro expressions and things like that, to him, it looks like he has control, but he doesn't feel, doesn't feel like you're trying to do something, okay? Uh, there's a technique called muso dori, okay? It can be translated as nothing alike catch or no action catch. And we'll talk about that muso again here in just a minute, right? Um, it's just a straight norm board, right? He grabs a sleeve, you shift off, your hand goes to here, right? Rock in, catch this, turn it over, bring him down, right? Okay. But the thing is, is that if I touch his, if I touch his arm and he feels it as a threat, he's going to instinctively lock that shoulder and bend that elbow and resist against that pressure. So Muso, no action catch is he can't feel that as it's going on. And by the time he realizes he's been attacked, any attempt to resist, escape, or come at you backfires and starts to open this part of the shoulder up and it's a shoulder dislocation. Most people do it as an elbow attack. No, you're using the elbow to attack the shoulder, to immobilize the shoulder, okay? So it's not the same. Anyway, but the idea here is he can, he can feel it. He knows that I'm there, but there's no intent to do harm to him. So it doesn't fire his flinch response. Right. Uh, another one is there's this strategy in, in some of the Kamai. I'm, I'm just going to pick one. Right. There's a sword Kamai called Jizuri Gaidan. Jizuri Gaidan. OK, it's a low level posture, but the sword is down and off to one angle or the other. So it kind of creates an opening in the front. Right. So if I just go from here and I just bring it down, but I'm looking at him like, there's an opening, dude. Come on in, right? Only a freaking moron's gonna come in, right? And then in which case I believe he deserves what he gets. Okay. But Zudi Gaidan, when I drop this sword, if I drop my shoulder and kind of create this balance issue and this opening, and I drop my head, okay, in a way that that communicates to him that I'm fucking exhausted. This works really well after, you know, this guy's been through a couple of things. He doesn't know, doesn't know how fresh you are, not, or whatever, right? Or I just cut. I did a case of giddy, and I come through, and it's in this position, right? So he's going to take advantage of a perceived opening, okay? So Jizuri Gaidan, 
at its base can be used as the starting point because it's the end of a previous cut, right? But from a hidden intention perspective, I'm going to feign weakness. I'll talk about that here in a minute, right? Where I'm in this position, I'm shifting, I just kind of lower the sword and I just, I might even exhale at the same time, right? Looking at him like, let's just get this over with, right? So he perceives that I'm weaker, I'm in, in, a, in a disadvantaged position, and so he's willing to take the shot. It doesn't look like, okay? It's not the same, okay? So uh, just to get, there's, there's other kamai that do that as well. There is a hanbo kamai uh, called munen muso. Munen, munen muso, okay? which is also a primary combat principle in the Shinden Furoryu, Munen Muso. Munen, right, Mu, Munen, Munen. <laughs> munen means no thought, okay? That side of things is I'm not guessing about what he's trying to do. I'm paying attention and I'm, gathering information but i'm not just getting locked in on that because he could ultimately do something different right so i'm watching i'm not guessing i'm not trying to whatever right but at the same time there's no intention zen mind whatever happens happens if i'm not projecting intent he can't pick it up if i am projecting intent my body will tell, my body will show, my eyes will shift, my jaw will clench, my brow will drop, my hands might start ringing on the sword, whatever, right? Muso means no action, okay? So this one, generally speaking, the, the whole thing is neutral, just neutral, neutral. This is mental, this is physical, but they're ultimately tied together, right? Munen, no guessing, right? Muso, no tells. There's no physical tells to give this guy something to read. Okay. And then ultimately we come down to this principle of Kyojitsu Tenkan. Kyojitsu, truth. Okay. Tenkan. To juxtaposition, to switch. Kyojitsu Tenkan Ho is the method of juxtapositioning truth and falsehood. Now that's when everything starts to double back because it might look like I'm violating the muso and I'm giving tells, but if I'm doing ninjutsu correctly, anything that I'm doing to give him an indication of what's going to come next to give him his plan is ultimately wrong. Okay. Uh, and an ex wife, <laughs> students used to say, man, he's unpredictable. My wife, my ex-wife would go, no, he isn't. He's absolutely predictable. They go, really? What's the secret? She goes, it's easy. Whatever I think he's going to do, he's going to do something else. Well, what's he, what is he going to do? I don't know. I just have come to find that um, whatever I assumed isn't, isn't the thing. Okay. So uh, anyway, right? So I guess I was predictable in my unpredictability, but I'm still, they, they, their starting point is always, I have to wait and find out. Okay. I have to wait and find out. So Kyuj Tenkan takes these things and starts to flip them and combine them so that you're even beyond, am I using overt or hidden? Well, okay. So that's where we go from the Kamai of the heart in the early stages, Kokuro no Kamai, Kamai of the heart. I'm presenting what I feel what I'm intending to do to you. And we flip that to kage no kamai. Kage no kamai. Hidden. Ghost. Kamai. Right? Which means that whatever kamai I'm taking up with my body is to get your processes and to control your perceptions. Right? But the kamai I'm actually in is in here. Okay? So it's not the same. Right? But uh, so the principal kids Tenkan, right? Um, here's just some suggestions. If you're the weaker, right? Feign strength. Okay. If you're good at grappling, move around like a puncher or a kicker. You don't have to be good at punching and kicking to learn how to move around like a good puncher kicker. Right. Uh, same thing. If I'm good at punching and kicking, then move around like a grappler. 
Okay. Cause I need to get him thinking in one direction. And then, so he'll come in in a way where he thinks he has the advantage. See, the, ultimately the idea is to get things to be done quickly, easily, effectively, efficiently, the least amount of wear and tear on you. Okay. Not two minute bouts, not five minute rounds, not okay. Done. Okay. That's a warrior's ideal. Again, I mentioned the Russian Ukrainian war, right? Russia thought that was going to be an easy take two years ago. They're a much, much bigger freaking country. What the hell? Okay. Right. Anyway, I know lots of people are coming to the little guy's aid and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, back to Cubes today, right? So uh, if you're dealing with a stronger opponent, feign weakness. So when he comes in, then go strong. Okay, that kind of thing, right? So the goal of all this is to ultimately give him nothing. And when he comes, take everything. Okay, that is the difference between a warrior and a martial artist or a fighter who's trying to win a match. Okay, which is why in previous lessons, when I say you take him to the brink of death, and then you give him back his life, which is a principle in the Gilko school. Okay? You give him back his life. People don't understand that. You just you just let this guy live. I put the fear, I didn't put the fear of God in him. I put the fear of me in him, right? I have I have I have given him back something really, really precious. Okay. And it can go one of two ways, but I should have read him and I should read him when he stands up. And I'm never going to take my attention off of him, but turn somebody who was attacking you yesterday into a bodyguard or a friend for the rest of your life because because okay so again the ultimate goal of all the stuff that i'm teaching these high level tactics and strategies is to give him nothing to work with but when he comes take everything all right, so if you want some examples of uh, using some of these things and this intention idea in physical form, we've got this Friday virtual masterclass training that we're doing. It's four dollars and ninety-five cents, or four dollars and ninety-nine cents. They want a short change of four cents. Four cents. Um, U.S. Uh, we've got it coming up this Friday. If you go to that link, it's already set up right now. You can get your spot reserved. There's only twenty spots because I need to handle class students and virtual uh, and be able to answer questions and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's pretty much my limit. So. Uh, if you want in, there's your opportunity. If not, well, then as always, I've given you plenty to add to your own training. And um, yeah, you can do what you need to do. And uh, hopefully I'll see you again next week on Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday.